Welcome to Study with the Best, the magazine show that's all about CUNY. I'm Tina Beth Pina. Today's show highlights the visual arts. From the subway platforms in New York City to the deserts of rural Mexico, from the Brazilian favelas in Queens to a pop-up art shop in Manhattan, we're looking at art across the CUNY spectrum. First up, the Brazilian slums, known as favelas, have a harsh reputation. But that perception is changing with the help of Brazilian artists and Queens College. What's behind me is Projeto Mojinho, the Mojinho project, which has been called a social sculpture. In other words, a sculpture whose borders between art and everyday life are not clear. It's something put together by uh, a group of artists in the Pejera da Silva neighborhood of Rio de Janeiro. As children, they were living in their neighborhood at a moment of intense conflict between drug traffickers and police. And this was an escape, a way that they could say, stay safe and enjoy themselves. What they developed was a role-playing game. It's a virtual reality. They used Lego avatars to depict different archetypes of Rio citizens. People soon began to notice what they were doing. They appeared on a variety of Brazilian TV shows and National Geographic. They themselves have traveled to Berlin, to London, to New York, to East Timor. This is their first installation in the United States. And it's one that we really prize, I, I would say most of all, uh, in relation to the engagement between CUNY students and these young people from Rio. I was basically part of the whole creation process. Started painting bricks from the very beginning um, and then assembling them and arranging them. I didn't know much um, about favelas. I had seen them depicted in films like City of God. I knew that they are a social phenomenon in Brazil. From working with the artists, I just learned that much has changed in their community. They were like evaluating and interpreting what was going on in their surroundings through the act of play, as they called it. Before, I was talking to you about the film City of God, which was my only impression beforehand of favelas. You, you know, according to that film, it's all violence. These kids, who grew up were the same kids who came here to work with us. I got to work here on the favelas. I got to build them, I got to paint them, and I got to know the people who I worked with. They have kind of a the cynical way of looking at things. They can't trust the police there. Obviously there's that, but you know, there's kind of innocence behind it as well. I helped with the project in many different ways, from the initial stages of the actual painting of the Brazilian bricks to mixing the concrete. It's changed my awareness of favelas. Getting to meet the people who actually came from favelas, you have to see what they're actually like, and they're actually just regular people. Favelas are often seen as sort of these dangerous or exotic zones that are outside of the city. And the best sociological work indicates that, in fact, they're, they're essential parts of the city that are tied into labor markets and consumption and all sorts of politics throughout Rio. And I think that what they're doing with this is enacting that message. It's very inspiring that in an environment that we might perceive as being um, a very violent space, um, and an impoverished space, something so creative and smart and <laughs> dynamic can come about. It recognizes that favelas are places of inequality and violence and even drug dealing. It presents a much more complex picture of the, the community. People who live in a neighborhood where there's discrimination or poverty are not constantly simply reacting to that discrimination and poverty. It's not like you can explain everything they do through that. That people around the world look for joy and it's not simply an antidote to pain. Oftentimes this is seen as you know outsider art or naive art and I think that they very much reject that designation. That this is art that is about the core of what it is to be from Rio. Susan Kreil is a renowned artist whose work hangs in the world's most prestigious museums. We went to her Manhattan studio to hear more about her latest work, which she describes as moving between the poles of beauty and horror.
My work has been a kind of interweaving over the years where I pick up a theme, it may disappear for a while, and then it picks up again in another incarnation from another angulation. In 1991, when the Gulf War happened, I had a real break and a shift in my work, uh, and that's when the work turned sort of overtly political. And from that point on until now, I've worked in a bifurcated way. I'm always working on something that has more to do with the beauty side, whether it's the fading, disappearing colors of the walls of Rome, or whether it's the sort of ancient worn tiles and patterns of some of the great cathedrals in Italy. That sort of gives me a sense of beauty and that other side while I'm working on 9-11, the burning oil fields, Guantanamo, Abu Ghraib. There was something so unacceptable that we would torture people. You know, given all of our rhetoric about human rights and uh, so forth, The internet really played into this so much. And I felt that you couldn't, I couldn't disassociate myself from those photographs. This man was in Egypt. He was taken off an airplane. It was a mistaken identity. He was standing on his tiptoes in that. He would have drowned if he had let go. And that was testimony that, that I had read. I, he finally did get released. The doctors, psychologists, were involved in, complicitly involved, in creating the circumstances of what happened in these black boxes. They figured out what were the phobias that these men had. These are actually the size of the black box, and that's exactly how they fit into it. I've tried to show the distress and the discomfort of what it must be like to be in, in a container like that for hours and hours and possibly days on end. The metaphor for me was when I found the, basically the white line, uh, the chalk line, with all of its associations at a crime scene that's drawn on the pavement or whatever, or when there's an accident where the body was. I also thought about Pompeii, where what was left after those terrible fires were these voids of where the human beings had been. And what they then did was they poured plaster into these voids to, to recreate the figures. That sense of the void uh, and of that fragility of what that line is. The skin is a protection. It's a major protection, obviously, for the body. And when someone is tortured, what happens, I believe, is that that protective layer is gone. It becomes porous. It becomes no longer there. I do think that beauty has been an entry point in, into some of this more horrific work. Because if you, all you see is the horror, you just automatically turn off. I think that if you can enter it and then begin to feel and experience the horror, I think it's a stronger experience. I need that balance. The eventual thing that I want to do is to finish the third part, as I see it, of the trilogy. The first being Abu Ghraib, the second being Guantanamo, and the third I would like to investigate the American prison system. Because I think they're all interconnected. They're all interconnected with torture, abuse, with rationalization of things that are simply unacceptable, like uh, how can you say that 10, 20, 30 years of solitary confinement is not torture? I would hope that one is able to connect in with one's own experience about what it is to be in pain, what it is to inflict pain, uh, and to maybe think about it uh, and feel it in some way. LaGuardia Community College has a new photo exhibit on display that's off the beaten path.
Rudolfo de Caballeros Between Heaven and Earth captures the harsh reality of the desert in northern Mexico as well as the uncommon occupations of its people. Vida, ay vida. It's uh, very emotional for me to, to see the, the photographs over here. When I came here for the very first time, and I saw all the galleries at the Soho, uh, Greenwich Village, the museums, and I said to myself, one day you have to, to show your work here. So now I'm doing it. <laughs> You have to be very careful with these photographs because they are in color and color is, can be tricky. When I use this uh, strong color, it's because I'm, I'm Mexican, that's the way I see. But my photographs are kind of sad for me because things for all these people should be better than they are. As far as I can see, we are not connected to Mother Earth, so to speak. And because of that, we are not connected to heaven. So we are living in a space between. When I think about it, I say to myself, what are we doing to survive in this space? I can see a lot of struggle in order to make a living over here. I was driving a truck, 4x4, with some friends, and in the middle of nowhere, and all of a sudden, we saw this cover. And inside of the cover, I found this beautiful lady. She made all these baskets in order to get some money for her and for her baby. It's a lot of order inside, a lot of beauty, a lot of color, with uh, the most humble element. This photograph is from the, an area of uh, Durango, Durango State, and the name of the place is Dinamita, like a dynamite, because there used to be a, a factory from DuPont, but they left, DuPont left. So it's not a kind of ghost town, but beautiful place. And I used to go very often because I found this place very quiet, very strange. I really like to be here in the desert. And one day, all of a sudden, from the nowhere, this guy appears, and then he said, I work here on this quarry, getting the stones so, to sell it and get some money. But what that really attracts me was the, this guy is the same color of the stone. These guys, they are very, very young, and nevertheless, they are working on their own business. And the business is a very complex one because they fly balloons. I don't know how to fly a balloon, but they know. I feel a lot of love from Mexico because I spent all my life in Mexico seeing the color of the food. Sometimes I feel uh, I miss the food. Sometimes I miss some friends, some relatives. And I really miss the color. I really miss the color. A recent exhibition here at the James Gallery focuses on a realist painter who lived to be 112 years old. Teresa Bernstein was an American artist who lived from 1890 to 2002. We actually believe that she exhibited in every decade of the 20th century. She paints Gloucester, Massachusetts, which is where she had a summer home. 
She paints daily scenes in New York City, including the elevated trains, people on the street, suffragette parades. Teresa Bernstein, I think because of her interest in scenes of daily life, has been aligned with the Ashcan School of Artists. The Ashcan School wanted to paint everyday kind of gritty reality. So Teresa Bernstein would go out onto the street and sketch things, and then she'd go back into her studio and paint them. With the vibrancy of color and the types of colors she's used and the emotionality to her paintings, I think she can be aligned with the German Expressionists. This is Teresa Bernstein's painting, Lost, from 1920. This one in particular is extremely autobiographical, directly related to Teresa Bernstein's emotions about having lost a, a daughter. This is one of the paintings that is very expressionistic in the use of color and in the brush strokes. She's trying to show her emotion through the painting. The window, there's actually a baby carriage, a woman holding a baby in front of a house, and then the angel of death here. Then there's also a small angel here in the vase. And then there is a vase holding three peaches, which I think you could argue represent William Meyerowitz, her husband, the baby, and Teresa Bernstein. But also the peaches appear in another painting as representative of the different stages of life, of youth and maturity and adulthood. By looking at an artist like Teresa Bernstein, who made a very definitive choice to stay a realist artist. We can learn a lot more than we already know. There's so much art history of the United States, particularly in the 19th and early 20th century, that we haven't studied and that needs to be studied. And by studying Teresa Bernstein's life and her career, I think that that broadens our understanding of our, our culture. Commuters in the city might not know it, but there is a wide variety of art created by CUNY artists as part of the MTA's Arts for Transit program. I've been doing public art commissions for about 10 years now. Even though I had never worked with laminated glass before, they told me it was a laminated glass project. Because it was this fabrication technique, I could basically make the design as complex as I want it to. So then I just thought, well, why don't I make it as bright and cheerful and startling as possible? The panels were installed in the summer of 2012. I have four laminated glass windscreens. When it was first installed, people would actually just kind of stop in their tracks, and a lot of people would look, and some would photograph. And that was actually, it was just nice to see that it gave them something. The title of the piece is called Rediscovery. I'm talking about the fact that the world is magical and that at one point we discovered this, but we kind of periodically have to rediscover it. My work is very intricate and ornamented and I use a lot of pattern and repetition and I use a lot of layering. It is in this way that I get kind of a sense of complexity, even though all the individual elements are very simple. All of the patterns are basically based on nature. There are a lot of circles, there are a lot of spirals, there are a lot of bubbles, dots. I think that the work also re just references a lot of things. It references flowers, it references pearls, it references fabric. If you look at the station, it's just a very functional station. It's not unattractive, but it's, there's nothing particularly attractive about it. A little lifting your day visually is a good thing. It's one of the largest subway commissions in the system. It was a $300,000 commission. You know, it was re originally pitched as a gateway to the Upper West Side. This is 14 years ago. The Upper West Side's changed quite a bit in that time. Back in the 70s, 80s, Verity Square was known as Needle Park. Junkies would hang out there and they would leave their works. And before we built that station, um, it was a rat-infested, not such a nice place. But I saw that location, Verity Square, as a departure point. They were talking about how to bring light 
down into the tracks below, how, how to bring light down into the station. I said, you have to use light. And because I had done so much studying how the light would work, I could show them exactly what it would do. I did my research. I, I studied the Crystal Palace, which that design is based on. I researched Giuseppe Verdi. I researched Rigoletto, uh, one of his operas. I thought that mosaic and Italian tradition combined with Verdi and his musical scores and this notion of Crystal Palace, the train shed, how can we combine all these together? The whole project took five years to start to finish. It was so much pressure. It took a year just to place all the pieces. The paving around that station matches the pattern that I created, the quatrefoil pattern that I created in my mosaic. That artwork, that design, it, it's not just the, the skylight that I made, but it's the, the whole Verdi Square. I did the engineering, and to know that millions of people are walking underneath my glass and that it's safe, uh, in addition to beautiful, it's a great feeling. For artists, it's an honor to be a permanent part of the fabric of, of New York, to have a piece that will survive you. It will last much longer than me. I'm Barry Mitchell. This is the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And in the tiny basement of this nondescript building at 163 Eldridge Street, there's a bright, brand new fashion boutique. Or is it? So this month, we're showing Lucy McKenzie's fashion line. She does this line with the designer Becca Lipscomb. But this is actually the Artists' Institute, a project of Hunter College CUNY. Jenny Jasky is curator. And they've installed a boutique, a full-scale operating boutique in the Artists' Institute, where they're showing garments that they've designed on sale for the public. So some of our audience will be coming here to see Lucy McKenzie as an artist. Other people from the public will be coming just to buy a nice sweater. So I'm very happy to be in New York once again uh, with a fashion collection by Atelier EB. We have a very interesting and loyal and experimental customer base here in New York. So we're really happy to be able to bring our beautiful clothes to them once again. Lucy McKenzie has a wide-ranging art practice. Based in Brussels, Belgium, she's originally from Glasgow, Scotland. She's known for her trompe l'oeil paintings, an art technique that means to deceive the eye by creating the optical illusion of three dimension. McKenzie also paints wall murals and writes crime fiction. Now for me, there's, there's analogies that can be made between certain kinds of painting or visual art and certain kinds of writing. The construction of a story and the construction of a painting. I'm, at the moment, I'm thinking about the two, and so part of that is learning how to write in this commercial way. Lucy McKenzie came here through the generous donation of the Evelyn Crane's Cossack Painting Fund at Hunter College. Where she is leading a series of workshops for Master of Fine Arts painting students and lecturing about her work. The Artist Institute changes slowly in terms of the artists. We show just two artists per year. Each of them work with us for six months. But within that time period, we see many aspects of that artist's work. Our next episode with her will be showing some performance works that she's been working on. Slightly pornographic art film. And so, all together, they make a, a kind of complicated message. But the day we visited, Lucy and Becca were busy preparing for the grand opening of their boutique. AEB Atelier, Edinburgh, Brussels. As Lucy and Becca prepared the sweaters, Becca described how they collaborated on color choices. The colors are personal. For instance, this is called Victoria, but it, it's like heather. It's like the plant heather that is in the highlands all around Scotland. We wanted to pick something that was sort of within the collection. If this, is, if this re refers to nature and heather, then this is the polar opposite. This is nuclear. This is man-made looking. So we went with this uh, tartan scarlet. The Artists Institute, a project of Hunter College CUNY, showing established contemporary artists, many of whom have had shows at much larger institutions. We can offer them something different for their practice, which really allows them to research. So while our audience is learning about their practice, they are also growing their practice through the resources we can provide to them, which sometimes is really serving them better by being in a small space. It's like opening a play out of town. 
It is, <laughs> like summer stock theater. <laughs> Barry Mitchell, study with the best. All my life I grew up watching boxing with my family on Friday nights uh, in uh, San Francisco. All my father's friends would come over on Friday nights and they would watch Gillette Cavalcade of Sports and these guys would all talk and bet on every round and talk a lot of trash. This place is really alive. It's the magic of it is still here. What's your name? Jules. Alan. I'm Iran Barker. No, no, no. Oh, <laughs> so I saw you fight a lot, man. My name is Jules Allen. I'm a photographer, and I teach at Queensborough College in New York. I'm interested in social aspects of life, of living. I, I like the way people move in the gym and have to pay attention and be alert. I like all the, the movement of the bags, the rhythm, and the, uh, I like the sound of it, you know? It's beautiful to watch, man. It's beautiful to watch. The photographs that I make are about African-American culture in, in effect. I mean, uh, being responsible and mature. I mean, I hate photographs of black people sitting around being dependent, victimized, uh, criminalized. I can't stand that type of imagery. So you aren't going to shut it down, but you can counter it. This is a book that was shot in Gleason's gym between 1983 and 1986 when uh, Gleason's was on 30th. The book was published in 2011. You can't just walk in here with a camera and start photographing. I had to be part of a community. My uh, trainer, Bobby McQuillan, he said, uh, what do you do? And I said, I photograph. And he said, whatever you do, if you train with me, you'll be better at it. The crazy part is he was right. <laughs> uh, he improved my focus. His name is Rodney Watts. I boxed Rodney for three rounds. And the only reason that I'm here today because Rodney had mercy on my soul. <laughs> this is a gentleman, Rocky. We argued for two years. And I used to uh, mess with him all the time, tell him he didn't know what he was talking about. He raised up his pant leg, and there was a pistol in his ankle. I said, you crazy. And we laughed about it, but uh, he carried it everywhere he went. This is great to see that this has been able to sustain itself. You know what I mean? In, in, in trying times and troubled times, that this gym is still holding up and that it's uh, boxing is uh, embraced this way. Thanks for watching Studying with the Best. For all things CUNY, log on to our website at cuny.tv or you can Facebook and tweet us. See you next time. Bye. I spent, I'd say, almost 10 days in the, in the burning oil fields. I took about 1,000 photographs. I hadn't been able to, to read what I was looking at. It, it didn't make sense. And when I got there, I understood because it was like Mad Max is meeting you know, Alice in Wonderland. I mean, everything, the scale, the dimension of it.